As late as the 1860s, Aroostook County was a vast empty space at the top of Maine. Larger than Rhode Island and nearly as large as Massachusetts, Aroostook County presented its people with enormous transportation challenges. To move the county's lumber and agricultural products to U.S. markets prior to 1891 proved an almost impossible task. Um, Aroostook County is really a, a captive of its geography, you know. I mean, uh, the lumber industry, for instance, all the rivers flowed into New Brunswick, or almost all of them. Uh, so in a sense, uh, the ties between New Brunswick and Aroostook County were much closer in the early phase than ties between, say, Arista County and Bangor, or Arista County and the rest of Maine. Um, and the sheer isolation of that area really dictated the whole history of the region up until 1893. So um, the transformation that came with the railroad is, is, is awfully difficult to underestimate. Several attempts had been made to build a railroad to Arista County, but without success. To outside potential investors in Boston and New York, a rustic was just a trackless wilderness and unlikely to make a dollar. And it finally came down to the fact that if a railroad was going to be built into northern Maine, the people of the northern part of the state were going to have to be the ones to, uh, to actually build it. Um, and when this resolve was clear to everyone, I think the railroad went through without much trouble. It finally took a man of unusual courage, integrity, and will to make the northbound rail line a reality. Civil War veteran and successful lumberman Albert Burley of Holton made public a bold plan, a plan for the towns of Aroostook County to raise the funds themselves to get the project off the ground. It was called Burley's Scheme. The year was 1890. Hey, Albert Burley was uh, an interesting character because the Burley family had been so prominent in Aroostook County and, and in promotion of Aroostook County going way back to the early settlement days. Albert Burley came from a long line of transportation promoters and, and Arista County promoters, um, so he was in the right position to, to suggest this particular um, plan for building the railroads, which was basically to uh, have the towns along the right-of-way um, contribute, or at least buy bonds, I, I think, uh, buy bonds or in some ways contribute financially to the building of the railroad. Um, they had gone to the state in earlier incarnations of the Northern Rustic Railroad. State was um, turned them down several times. They'd gone to Bangor to try to get funds for the railroad. This didn't work either. The town of Bangor, I think, three times voted against funding the railroad. So finally, um, Burley suggested that the towns in Rustic County, along the right of way, buy up the bonds for the railroad. And essentially they did, and the railroad was completed. Albert Burley fired the imagination of Aroostook County citizens and even pledged his own fortune to the venture. The missionary work and financing were completed by June 1, 1892, and construction started eastward at Brownville and westward at Holton. Looking at the fading photographs of a century ago, heroic is not too strong a word for the work of the Italian and Irish laborers who built much of the Bangor and Aroostook. With only the simplest of tools, these men carved a railroad out of the forests and mountains of northern Maine. The first train steamed into Holton on December 16, 1893, but in order to meet that deadline, the track was laid on snow and ice for the last few miles. One passenger on that first train was a 14-year-old boy, Fred L. Putnam. Putnam would later become a director of the railroad and would serve until the mid-1970s. Construction continued, and between 1892 and 1916, the railroad and its branches reached into northern Maine. The Bangor and Aroostook ranged from Fort Kent at the top of Maine to Searsport at its southernmost point. A total of 870 miles of track were constructed. The heroic era of, of railroad building in the United States was well over by that time, and um, even filling in some of the, some of the uh, areas that have been left behind after the completion of the transcontinentals and some of the other large routes have been completed by the 1890s. So it probably is uh, one of the last large rail lines built uh, in the East. The building of the railroad had a more dramatic effect on the rustic than even Albert Burley had dreamed. 
the change that came uh, was remarkable in um, evaluation, for instance, of property in the northern part of the state, uh, in some cases, um, rose by a third or a half or even two thirds over the, over the decade between 1890 and 1900, and then rose again phenomenally uh, by, by 1910. And this was largely, I think, uh, the construction of very large sawmills in the northern part of the state. Um, because for the first time, large lumber shipments could be made from northern Maine into the uh, metropolitan markets uh, like Boston or New York uh, through, through rail uh, service into these areas. But there was really no good way that Arusta County could market um, produced lumber uh, prior to the building of the Bangor and Arusta Railroad. There were some short lines that came in to, uh, from from New Brunswick into Holton first in 1870, and then uh, in the 1880s into Presque Isle and uh, into the valley as well. But um, these were not through routes. Uh, basically, they had to go into New Brunswick and then back into Maine uh, at that time. So the Bangor Arusta was really responsible for opening up the lumber industry in Arusta County, and the change was phenomenal. During the years when Aroostook farmers had to depend on Canadian branch rail lines to move their products, commercial agriculture was a minor activity. But an American railroad changed all that. Potato production began a little bit earlier in the sense that most agriculture in Aroostook County, commercial agriculture, and a lot of it was subsistence up until the railroads came in, but uh, commercial agriculture in Aroostook County was geared towards the lumber camps, and I assume a lot of potato production um, went into the lumber camps in the wintertime. However, uh, this is very lim a very limited market compared to um, the potato industry after the Bangor and Aroostook Railroad. Now, the first starch mills were actually built when the rail lines came over from New Brunswick in the 1870s and 1880s. You see a few potato starch mills built in places like Holden and, uh, I believe, Presque Isle. Um, but the, the change in the industry after 1893 was phenomenal, and that's, as you say, I think that's really the beginning of potato industry as we know it today. It began with the Bangor and Aristic Railroad. Well, the railroad was a very, very big thing in the county, no question about that. That's why it, uh, it came in for a lot of knocks, uh, as well as some praise, but uh, uh, yes, the, the railroad was was what made the potato industry operate. Without it, it, uh, it never would have uh, become what it did. 31 years after the first B&A train reached Holton, Aroostook County was growing and shipping by rail 25% as many potatoes as all seven major potato producing states combined. The railroad was also responsible for the birth of the paper industry in northern Maine. B&A General Manager Franklin Cram was able to persuade Garrett Skenk that construction of a paper mill in Millinocket was a viable idea. According to some correspondence from Cram after the fact, I, I don't know that this is entirely accurate, but uh, he claimed that Skenk was willing to scrap the whole Millinocket project over a few cents uh, cost in shipment from Millinocket South. Um, which goes to show you just, I think, how important the railroad was to, to the town itself. If the building of the railroad had been difficult, operating the new enterprise in the harsh climate was equally challenging. The long winters, heavy snowfall, and subarctic cold taxed the men and their machines. Well, at the worst place you could pick up a squaw pan. An oak field, an oak field that goes south. Uh, oak field went too bad with the terminal, but uh, uh, Pen is the worst one. I've left Madawaska with three units here not too long ago. And uh, 35, 40, 50 cars. I picked up a few squares at Fort Ken. And maybe, and, uh, maybe you can there with 50 cars. Well, it's cut the crossing. By the time you pick up another three, four units, you have six, seven units out of there. And by the time you get all round up, by the time you come back, it's 25 or 30 below zero. Forget it. You ain't going to leave there with 100 cars. There's no way in hell you can release the brakes. We tried it. We left there with 65, 70 cars, that's about all you go. Seems so if you go all down Mon and we went to work, there'd be a snowplow stuck in front of us. And of course they were they was that was a rough deal. Uh, we didn't get going as fast as we would on a regular plow train, but it was fast enough so that the calves was always wet and miserable. Especially if it was a light snow, it would um, 
blow up, come in around the, the cab, and a lot of times you couldn't see across it. Yes, if there was one single factor that shaped the character of the Bangor and Aroostook, it was the climate of northern Maine. Bitter cold, deep snows. I can remember the, the winter of uh, 1933 and 34 was the worst winter we ever had. And every train, every freight train went out, had a plow. And we had to run plows ahead, bought all the passenger trains. It, was ter it snowed every day, all went along, never let up. Winters, hard winters. I think the thing that sticks out in my mind is the years, the years of snow that we had so much snow. And I was in Easton, which is on the Fort Fairfield branch. And there's times when our train would disappear completely underneath the snow. And I was in a in a cut, what you call a rock cut. And I've been walked from the station in Easton to down the tracks to get word to the train crew what to do. We had no communications at that time. And when I got there and couldn't even see the train, just a hole up through the snow, it was unbelievable. The automobile roads would remain unplowed in winter until the late 1930s. So the railroad provided a lifeline for people and products to the world outside. But that lifeline required great human effort for much snow removal in the railroad switching yards was accomplished by men with simple shovels. I've had as much as 40 snow shovels in the locker yard in years past when I was there to keep everything going. But back in them days, the main thing was to keep your switches clean. They didn't want the train crews to wait for a switch and that's all there was to it. They, they wanted you clean one way or another and it took men to do it. It was all done by hand way back. In fact, yards like uh, Oakfield, Millinocket, Northern Main Junction, uh, you have over a hundred men shoveling snow, and they shovel it as high as they could. And then there'd be a crew of men up on that shelf and shovel up another shelf. And I've seen three tiers, 30 feet deep, where they got all the snow out of the yard, or out of the way. And it was a long while before we got into very much power handling snow. It was all done by hand. And in those days we paid men 25 cents an hour. The coal-fired steam locomotive. It was near the peak of its development during the B&A's formative years. The era of the steam locomotive symbolized the romance of the railroad. But up close, the world of steam required tough men and great skills. You know, the, the person that ever labeled the steam locomotive, the iron horse, they certainly knew what they were talking about because they was a breed all in their own. And uh, you had to let them know who was the boss. Some of them you had to work them harder to get the horsepower out of them. And other, my favorite engine was always a 102, 103, and 105, and 107. And I figured if I had them locomotives, that I had it made. Now, I like steam. I loved it. Maybe some people say I'm crazy, but I really like steam. I like the challenge. I like the noise. I like the smell. Everything about it. Steam was the romantic, romantic part of railroading because everybody likes steam. The engineers and firemen that took great pride in their steam locomotives. And uh, now, for instance, uh, Fred DeWire ran on one and two there for years, and I can see him now. He used to have Earl Park in the summertime as his fireman. They'd back up from the engine house at Van Buren, called on number two. Before they backed up, they had wiped that hole jacket down and you could see your face in it anywhere. They just took pride in keeping them looking good. Well, there was a special smell to the smoke, to the, to the coal smoke that you don't have anymore. And, uh, you know, uh, that's when a man put out a day's, you, you put out a day's work for a day's pay. And uh, I like the steam locomotive. Only thing is, uh, you know, you, you, it was more work and it was dirty. Charlie Hartford was one of my favorite old-time engineers, and he used to say, you know, you got to kick him in the shins once in a while to show him who the boss is. 
And Charlie would talk to his locomotive, and I can always remember a one time that Walter Seavey was firing for Charlie, and they was on an extra yard in all the main, and when they got to Mill Market, they were printing air out of coal and sand. They went to the engine house, and they got the coal and the water, and come to find out the sand, they'd run out of sand, and there'd be quite a delay before they get any. So Charlie said, well, he says, we'll go without sand. And so they get up on Summit, the hardest grade on the Southern Division, heading towards Oakfield, and they get up there, and Charlie starts putting the sanders on. The engine was slipping a little bit, and he kept notching it forward all the time. And, and uh, Stevie said to him, Wallace said to him, he said, Charlie, he said, you know, he says, uh, you haven't got any sand. He said, I know it, and you know it, but this engine don't know it, he said. <laughs> As the crash of 1929 deepened into the Great Depression, the 37-year-old railroad tightened its belt along with the rest of the country. Still, Bangor and Aroostook jobs were greatly sought after in an environment where any work was a precious commodity. As you know, the Depression was on and times was real tough. And I was supporting my mother and my teacher, my sister was teaching school for $16 a week. And I had a chance to get down to the railroad station as messenger boy for $5 a week. And the railroad allowed the messenger boy $2.50 a week to seal the cars and check the yard and deliver freight. And I had three coal stoves to look after, which took 13 hods of coal a day in the, you know, real cold weather. And, but it was, Great to have a job and feel a little bit secure with the steady income. I said, get up 35 and, and then 60 or 70 and then 75. And you had to do a damn good day's work for the money they were paying, because that was good pain them times, you know. You just get up in the morning, you done what you had to do, and that was it. As the bitter decade of the 1930s drew to a close, the certainty of war quickened our country's economic pulse. The Bangor and Aroostook was to play an important part in America's war effort, carrying food from Aroostook farms to the rest of the nation and war materials to be shipped from the railway's deep water port at Searsport. The railroad at that time, we were handling bombs. We were handling uh, fuels into Presque Isle, uh, and some other air bases. We were handling troop trains. Uh, there was several things being shipped out of the port of Searsport. I guess the best experience we had was uh, when we had the German prisoners of war. They had a <coughs> camp in Holton, and there were about 90 men in that camp. And we used them to good extent in ballasting track, laying rails, putting in what few ties we had, surfacing, ditching, all of the manual labor that normally would be required. And I will say that uh, there were Germans, uh, there were young, blonde boys, just as healthy as they could be. You couldn't help but like them. They didn't cause us any trouble at all. Well, we used to have uh, train loader logs come in every day come down from St. Francis, and it came in on 84, and uh, we'd have probably uh, 12 or 15 cars for the Keegan Mill, and about the same amount for uh, Canada. And the ones for Canada were loaded in low side gondolas, and they were hardwood. And they were going to Montreal for the manufacture of the Mosquito Bombers, which were made completely of wood and were made in Montreal by the Canadians, which, uh, as I understand, we're very successful over in Europe. I started August 14th, 1945, the day before VJ Day. And uh, they announced the war was over one day too soon. So we tied down the whistles on all the steam locomotives we had sitting around the yard and in the engine house. And they claimed that they could hear them out the Holton, out the dispatching office out there. Well, and actually on the 15th was VJ Day, and we had to do it all over again. I don't know of any company or any organization that was any more dedicated to the war effort 
and the people on the bank on the roost. And this is every one of them, those that went and those that stayed here. In the first 40 years of its existence, the Bangor and Aroostook had come to be known as the Potato Railroad. Shipping of Aroostook potato harvest reached its peak in those years immediately following World War II. In those days, uh, the railroad felt it had a very poor year if it didn't ship 40,000 carloads of potatoes. And I can remember at least one year when it was well over 50,000 carloads. We used to, well, we used to work all night at Fort Kent. And then, well, you had Fort Kent and Brad being done. And then you had, you go down and you had to, you started at uh, Robbins, St. Louis, Frenville and Cleveland, and we'd work all night steady. A lot of times, of course, then there was 16 hours, eh? and then after a while it dropped to 14 and then 12, and now it's eight, but <clears throat> six, and a lot of times we spent the whole 16 hours switching potatoes. Well, like I say, it'd be three to 400 cars of potatoes a night through there in the wintertime. And extremely cold nights, they couldn't take all the tonnage out of there, and some of it would lay over until the next night, and then you'd have, you know, 400 plus cars of potatoes out of there which would convert into 25 to 30,000 ton per night out of there. Sometimes there, they was, they, was, they was having a hard time getting an empty car. Didn't have enough come in. So they'd put him in wherever the, you know, the fuller, his orders were in ahead of anybody else, well, he'd get a car, but he might have had two, three cars on order. He'd only get one. We had the greatest bunch of potato shippers that was ever born. I think the Arista County people are a different group of people. They're just wonderful. Well, I can tell you what the highest month we had was in March, I think it was 1946. And in the month of March, we handled 10,000 cars into Oakfield out of Arista County alone, which is a lot of potatoes. In the beginning, moving potatoes in the bitter cold of Maine winter challenged the ingenuity of those early railroaders. Potatoes moved first in what came to be known as line boxcars. Uh, what this was was a boxcar that they used to haul paper or pulpwood or whatever, and they lined it with uh, sheathing paper and put hay on the floor and uh, loaded it with potatoes back there. And in the middle of the car, they had a stove, a wood stove and they used to sign a man to six or seven cars, and he rode with these cars to destination, kept the fire going. And they called them potato bugs. And of course, that was a dirty job. You know, wood fire and open up those cars with the smoke in them and so forth. But that's what they did to start with. But if Albert Burley's railroad made an impact in the agricultural and economic life of Maine's largest county, it had at least as much social impact. Before the age of the automobile, moving people was a vital part of the railroad's job. For a rustic people, the coming of the B&A ended the traditional isolation of winter. During the heyday of the passenger train, the railroad station became the hub of social activity. At Eagle Lake, everybody in town came to see the train go by. The train went up, up in the morning around 10 o'clock, the gin train, and in the afternoon it came down at at right around five. I remember it came down just as I, just, I had 10 minutes to, to uh, before the train went by and my day's work was supposed to be done. So, uh, but everybody in, in the town that was free came there to see that train go by. And I remember it cost, used to cost 35 cents to go to, to uh, Fort Kent. People buy uh, one-way tickets to Fort Kent and uh, there would be, there was a lot of traffic, you know, to people going up there to shop. Yeah, Rooster County went to work and went to bed on the basis of the B&A trains. There's no, no question about that. I had to laugh George Hall in Halton, who ran a, a wholesale retail uh, uh, construction supply store and also was connected with the Halton Trust Bank. Uh, he and I was talking about the day that we put on the new air-conditioned cars. 
I said to George, you know, George, it's pretty nice. You've got a, a nice air-conditioned car here. You don't have to bother to try to open up any windows to get good air. You get good, clean air without bothering to open the windows. George looked at me and said, who the hell was ever able to open a window on these old passenger cars of yours? I said, well, I guess I spoke out of turn. I'm sorry, I never opened one myself. In their heyday, the B&A's name trains, the Aroostook Flyer and the Potato Land Special, lived up to the images of the golden age of the passenger train. Pullman cars delivered passengers to Boston's North Station in time for a full workday and departed for the North late in the evening. But one B&A train was named by its passengers and still lives in legend, the Gin Train. It left Holton and wound up a hundred miles or so of the railroad's scenic Ashland branch to St. Francis, then returned in the evening. Story goes that years ago when they, before doing Prohibition, why uh, that train went up to, the, to St. Francis in Port Kent and you could get liquor across the line and they stopped everywhere anyway. If you, all you had to do was stand inside the track and they'd stop, see what you wanted. And they send up to give the money to the conductor or somebody in the train crew to bring them back some liquor. And when they come back, why, well, that's where I got the name Gin Train, bringing back the liquor from Fort Kent. That's where the, I, I, that's what was, was told to me, you know, to get that liquor. As early as 1936, improved highways and the increasing ownership of automobiles began to affect passenger train ridership. As demand for rail passenger service diminished on branch lines, the railroad turned to bus service to replace the trains. One of the first drivers was Robert W. Miller, later to become a railroad salesman. But as they took trains off, the B&A tried to furnish passenger service for uh, uh, the people in northern Maine. And like if they'd take the train off to the Fort Fairfield branch, then they'd put a bus running, serving all the small towns, like Fairmont, Easton, and uh, the same thing into uh, Ashland, a bus run from Fort Kent through, down through Eagle Lake, Ashton, into Presque Isle, met all the trains. Same thing in Caribou, they run <clears throat> into Washburn, Parham, Carson, and all school kids, and, and back then there weren't the cars there are today, and we served every house, really. We'd stop at any house. Uh, one time they had perhaps had 15, 18 bus drivers working. At that time, being a driver for the B&A, it was much like, I used to describe it as being an airline pilot with Delta Airlines at that time because they were really top jobs. Then $20, $25 a week salaries were large and it was a $50 a week job, so it was a, a real good job. I can remember the day the first bus ever, B&A bus ever, come into Mars Hill. Fred Lunt was the one driving it, and they had a fellow named Stahl, S-T-A-H-L or something like that, that was the second driver when they got two. And, uh, Lots of nights I'd be down the station practicing, see, on the telegraph with Herbie Fowler down Oakfield. And then I'd get in with the bus driver and ride up to the cross. And After the war, for two years, you couldn't get cars. The, the car market was there, but the, they weren't building cars. So there was a demand for bus travel. Eventually, B&A bus service was itself a victim of declining passenger ridership. The duty of driving the last B&A bus on January 21st, 1984, fell to George Clark, who more than 26 years earlier operated trip number six on its inaugural run out of Van Buren. There was little fanfare to mark the end of this historic era in Maine transportation. A little more than half a century after men with axes and teams of oxen and horses began clearing B&A's right of way, 
the railroad bought its first diesel-electric locomotives. The diesel locomotives had as much impact on the railroad industry as steam did for ships. We had a lot of the old-time engineers that said, well, this is not going to work. Uh, uh, we can't operate those, and there was a little resistance to it. But diesels had not been here six months before they were generally accepted, and they were so much more efficient than steam engines. Uh, when the first uh, diesel came in, I would say about 48. I remember they parked one in Van Buren there for about a week, maybe four or five days, and to let the people in town come and see it. And they had put steps to go, to go in the cab and steps on the other side to walk right across, come down the other side. And uh, people lined up. They brought school bus for kids to see that. And everybody came to see it because uh, they couldn't believe that uh, an engine like that wouldn't make any steam or smoke. Steam was fascinating to run and it was fascinating to see. But the diesels, in my way of thinking, was the best thing that ever happened to the railroad. And I can say that be simply because you didn't freeze to death in the winter time, and you in the summertime you didn't burn up on them. And of course, with the steam engines, when you was pushing the snow plow, the snow would come back, and the first place it would hit was the boiler, and then the steam would come right into the cab, and they'd get on your overalls, and everyone would get saturated. There's times when the, you couldn't see across the cab and see each other on account of so much steam in there. And then the minute you'd get out of the, the uh, snow drift, why, that would freeze on you. To me, that wasn't the way that I wanted to live. I don't have any regrets of running the steam locomotive. I'd run one tomorrow if I had a chance. But I think the diesels was much, much better and simpler to operate. Diesels are good. And whether I didn't want them or not, I, I was sorry to see them go. But they, uh, I, I hadn't, they hadn't been here two months before, I, and I was the guy that got right on them. I, I liked them. The last steam train operated on B&A's Greenville branch in 1953, marking an era of transition for the railroad. In the next 15 years, Bangor and Aroostook would see great changes, both in its traffic and technology. Until the 1950s, most of the work of the railroad was performed by hand. The diesel helped to change all that, and within 10 years, new track maintenance technology and other labor-saving machinery would change the way the B&A operated. Then we needed some machines to do proper ditching, and uh, no problem there at all. Uh, we we b bought a gasoline-powered uh, diesel shovel, mounted on a low flat car, from which we could do the ditching right from the track itself on each side. And it uh, all worked out to a good advantage. We got the water away from the track. We done everything by hand. The only piece of machinery that I ever saw in them days, they had a bolt machine, which was powered bolt machine. Pelly Goodall run that for us. And I don't know what year they started buying the machinery, but it must have been in the 60s, I would guess. I'm guessing now. But about the best improvement I ever saw for section men was the uh, towel for fixing the track. We done what they call candy, uh, gandy dancing when I first went on the railroad. You know what that was. That was tamping stage, and you one foot was up on that all the time. About 10 or 15 rails was about all you could get in a day. That was the cool men. But the CP started using this uh, towel. And Jim Sandman, of course, he lived up there, and they showed him how it worked, and it was so good that the B&A finally bought some. And that took a lot of the work out of uh, surfs in the track, because they lift it up, and you put it right on the end, the tire right on the hard track, had uh, pack there, and, and uh, one full towel was supposed to hold your track an inch, and so forth. But that was the biggest thing that helped the section, in, as far as I was concerned. By 1969, the extension of the interstate highway system into northern Maine and the bankruptcy of several northeastern railroads had slowed the railroad's booming potato business to a trickle. At a time when its fortunes were the lowest in its 78-year history, the B&A got a new owner 
who, like the railroad, was larger than life. Buck Dumaine had been involved in Northeast railroading for years and brought to the BNA a new spirit, an unshakable belief in the workforce and a contempt for railroad bureaucracy. A change was needed about, at about the time that uh, uh, Buck, uh, through Amoskeg, uh, uh, purchased the company. Uh, sh shortly after doing that, uh, he brought Alan Dustin and I in. We had met him on other properties, and uh, it was the only changes that he made to the management team. And uh, it was evident early on that the that there were good professional railroaders here. So uh, the the company actually was in trouble at about that time because of, uh, well, I guess it delayed change. Change was made in, uh, in uh, primarily to, uh, it was needed primarily to adjust to the change in, uh, in traffic available and because of the impact of the interstate system and, and the economy in general. Well, I think it's a good road, good people, well run, Actually, saying since, since old Buck, Buck made quite a change around here. He changed a, a lot. I have an idea; might have gone down the tubes if he hadn't come along. Sure, I, that's my idea that, that he would have, because he he put uh, he put money in it, and he put new life in it. He hired good men to run it, and that's that's the way I feel about it. The Dumain era was marked by increased investment in the physical plant. Ballast, rail and ties were installed and equipment upgraded. Nowhere was the Dumain philosophy more evident than in his relationship with his employees. Buck has an, a natural ability to make friends with the working men. And, and it certainly showed up on the Bang & Rustic, as I have seen it done on other companies that he's been associated with. Um, in spite of the fact we were shrinking in forces, primarily through natural attrition, um, uh, throughout the 20-year period that he had been involved with the railroad, uh, he has made great friends and, and well, they just love the man. And it's made it easier for those of us who were trying to operate the railroad because they had this they had this respect for uh, the ownership that was visual through Buck and uh, um, and it's genuine his feelings there are genuine they're real and people sense this who provides the money on your gross income not the president not the vice president it's the workers. Throughout the B&A's first century, it was the men and women who worked on the railroad who shaped its destiny and determined its fortunes. They still do. The little railroad was able to master its hostile environment and its one-crop economy because of the gritty determination of its employees. They reflect the land and the culture that gave them birth. And like an earlier generation, they remember how they came to work for the B&A. The first station I worked was Westfield. I lived in Van Buren. I didn't have a car. And uh, they told me that, well, first of all, that Johnny Hall, the chief dispatcher, got on a wire and asked me if I could uh, go on my own. And I told him I, th I thought I was ready. He says, we're going to need a man in Westfield. So I went to Westfield and stayed there about six months. Didn't have a car, so I couldn't travel back home. So I take the train Monday morning, pack myself a knapsack and a box with pots and pans and eggs and um, bread and stuff that I'd eat, coffee. And I'd head out Monday morning on train two out of Van Buren. They dropped me there at Westfield. And I'd come back home uh, Saturday night and I'd hitchhike. When I didn't feel like hitchhiking, I'd wait for number seven. And of course, as I said, we worked six days a week. And I had my bedroll and slept right on the floor, right near the coal stove. Get up in the morning and 
blow your nose out and be all full of soot. And I made two meals there. And the uh, noon meal, I'd go to a house next door to the station, and she charged me 40 cents a meal. So I'd have six meals there. But I made my breakfast and dinner. So I came up to Holton, and I walked into the dispatching office, and Lester Terrio was the chief dispatcher. And uh, Joe Curtis was in there, too. And Lester said, well, here's a fellow right here who's been over here before looking for a job. And uh, uh, Joe, uh, if you, if you probably didn't know him, but he was right, he was quite a, right to the point on everything. Joe said, uh, do you know anything about station work? And I said, well, I don't know at all. And he said, you come in here <laughs> to this office. He said, I've been looking for somebody for a long time that doesn't know, doesn't know at all. My first regular station was the winter of 47 to 48 at Goodrich Siding with a station there but had no electricity, cold stove for heat, which was all right, no electricity. And I lived in a shack. That, to bring my family with me, I had to live in a shack that had been used for a storage shed for 30-some years. And I made it livable. But it was so cold that the water in the tea kettle on the back of this oil stove would freeze at night. Tradition, the railroading tradition, values, hard work, a pride that bound man and machine together, an esprit de corps handed down from generation to generation, a pride that became the hallmark of the Bangor and Aroostook. So it, it was a prideful place, uh, the people that uh, worked there, I, th I think, uh, had a pride in what they did. Uh, uh, they would, they, their workmanship couldn't be uh, bettered anywhere in the United States. It was uh, uh, the salesmen that uh, called on me, and some of them had been calling on railroad for 40 or 50 years. Uh, I think of one when you uh, talk about characters with John Coolidge. But they, the salesmen would come in and when they went into the shops or, or into the store area, they just were amazed at the cleanliness and, and the uh, uh, pride that the people took in, the, in their workplace. It was, a, it was a great place to work, really. The people, they had an esprit de corps on the beginning, like the Marines. The Marine is, uh, is the best fighting men that country's got. Well, the BNA, you the CP was one outfit, the CN was one outfit, the main not the boss of me. But if you work on the BNA, you work for the best outfit. I think that's that. In some ways, the BNA in this first century generated a unique kind of loyalty and job satisfaction. BNA people gloried in being tough, in being good at what they did, and in being different from other people. You have to put your nose out in the cold weather, and uh, there's a lot of other people I don't know who would do that. And that's a little different. Don't make no difference if it's snowing, blowing, you're out there. And uh, 10 below or 60 above, it didn't make any difference what it was. You was out there, and uh, I think probably they're a little different breed of cats, no, no question. It's a funny thing, when you start working as a brakeman, you want to do so much, and you're never at the right place at the right time. But once you get a hold of it, I, uh, then it's, it, it comes and it's... To me, I've always, I'd go to bed at night and I was anxious to get up in the morning to go to work. Because it was almost like playing uh, anybody that plays bridge or something like that. It's almost like a game. You know, when you handle the list, it's switching boxcars, but it's really another different moves every day. And uh, it's almost like a game. And that's, what I, that's why I thought it was so interesting. I liked it. They're different. They were different from other groups. Whether they were used different or not, same material, I don't know. I don't know why they were, but they were sort of a loyalty to the railroad. Now, I personally had the same feeling. I just loved to see a locomotive go by or a train go by. It just felt, I just felt as though I was a part of something that really amounted to a lot. Moving goods, material, people, and uh, I think that the rank and file of the employees uh, of any railroad uh, had that spirit. 
it's interesting. It's a challenge every day. And the people, is, they're fantastic. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I, I've been here 37 years on the railroad, and I find that uh, uh, if you do your job and do it to the best you know how, you're going to get along fantastic, great. I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me, and I thank my good dad for that, to put me on the railroad, because I've enjoyed every minute of it. I wouldn't swap that for hardly anything. I had a good time railroad, and I liked it, you know. And I, I could switch cars with the best of them. The Bangor and Aroostook Railroad, a century of challenge, a century of growth, 100 years of bitterly cold winters, war, depression, and ever-increasing competition, but with the ability to survive and change for the future. As we develop into these new technologies, I think you're going to see the railroads continue to play an important role. Changed is the procedure, but still very important. The, the, the experts that tell us will tell us that the, by the year 2020, which is only 30 years down the road, which is a snap, all the known oil reserves in the world are going to be used up. You know, we went over in the Persian Gulf, and I don't know if we went for oil or not, but if all the oil reserves are going to be used up, uh, there's going to be a drastic change in the motive power, whether it be highway or rail or what. And, and I, I don't think you ought to think backwards, but I can foresee somewhere down the road that maybe even steam might come back onto the railroads. Heavy movement of heavy freight uh, will always require the cheapest possible mode of travel, and I think the railroad supplies that. Uh, as long as, as there's enough traffic to make it pay, we will always have railroads. As we move into the, to the uh, next decade and next century, uh, we'll find that rail transportation is a very important part of our uh, transportation system, as the rest of the world is today. The Bangor and Aroostook Railroad, 100 years old, rich in history, tradition, people, rich in its faith for the second 100 years. 